You may be seated. Take your Bibles and open to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll continue our study here in the book of 1 Timothy. The study is entitled Foundations for Faithfulness as we look at the blueprint for the church, how Paul and the Lord through Paul uh, instructs us Uh, to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the buttress of the truth. Our text this morning, the message is entitled, Exemplary Oversight. Exemplary Oversight. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Hear now the words of the living and true God. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, He must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. This is the word of the living and true God, and it is trustworthy in every point. Let's pray. God, shape us by this trustworthy word. Convict us, teach us, encourage us, build us up. And Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. Exemplary oversight. I want to give you another list this morning. Pastor, brother, priest, deacon, father, vicar, rector, chaplain, abbot. Bishop, minister, overseer, elder, presbyter, archbishop, cardinal, patriarch, pope, preacher, apostle, evangelist, and by far my favorite, preacher boy. All of these are titles of leadership that are used in the Christian tradition and have been used across the centuries of the Christian church. Some of them uh, describe the same office, but just with a different title. Others of them uh, describe different levels or hierarchy of office. But if, and if that list, if, if they had something in common, I want you to think about what would it be if all of those offices in the church had something in common, what, what would it be? Maybe, maybe to, to ask it more personally, what, what do you value most when it comes to the leaders in your church? What's the most important thing about those who lead God's people? If you were to craft the church's next pastoral help wanted ad, What requirements would you include in it? In the job description or in the the necessary qualifications, what things would you list out as important, as vital for those who are going to lead the household of God? That's what this chapter, chapter 3, is all about. What is required for God's leaders in God's church? And the answer in short is that They provide exemplary 
oversight. Last chapter, chapter 2, dealt with the roles and responsibilities of men and women in the church. We saw briefly that men lead in prayer and teaching, and women learn in godliness and submission to God's design. That, that's, that's in short, chapter 2, the roles and responsibilities of both men and women in a way that honors Christ, a way that, that adorns the doctrine of God beautifully. Uh, this chapter, chapter 3, comes back to that question of men's leadership in the church because it was just a couple verses at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, now Paul returns, lest you ladies think that he's letting the men off the hook. Not so. Chapter 3, he returns to the, the men and says, here's what uh, men's leadership in the church ought to look like. This foundation for faithfulness in God's church is this. If we are to be faithful... As, as a church of Christ, we must require exemplary oversight. If we are to be faithful as God's church, as the household of God, we are to require exemplary oversight. 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 are both texts which describe the same general list of qualifications for church office. And we've been learning in Sunday school class that there are two offices in the church, and only two biblical offices. That is the office of elder and the office of deacon. Elders and deacons are the offices which God has instituted or ordained in the church to function in leadership. Now, you'll notice that our text in chapter 3 used the word overseer. Right? And I just said that the office of elder is one of the two. Well, that's because the term overseer, the term elder, and the term pastor are all used interchangeably in the New Testament to refer to the same office. Okay, let me, let me prove it to you. Acts chapter 20, this is pertinent to us because you remember Timothy is serving in the church at Ephesus, right? That's where Timothy is pastor, where he is overseer, and so when Paul went and visited with the elders of the church of Ephesus, here's what he said, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And then as he's delivering his farewell address to them, here's what he says to them, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Something you need to know that I forgot to mention, the word pastor in the Greek is actually the word for shepherd. So it's the same word, shepherd, pastor. Okay, so what Paul says to those elders in Ephesus is that they are to, be, uh, to pay care, careful attention to the flock. Well, why is that? Well, because they're shepherds, they're pastors. The elders are pastors. And he says that, that, the, that the Holy Spirit has made them overseers in that flock which they pastor where they are elders. Do you see? All three of those terms used to describe the same office. Again, I can prove it in 1 Timothy 5. All three of these terms exist in this section of 1, Timothy, uh, sorry, 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, pastor the flock, exercising oversight, exercising bishopry or episcopally uh, over the, the flock. I just made that word up. Not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. So, so if that's enough uh, to, to kind of just give you an idea, if I use the word elder today in 1 Timothy 3, it's not because I can't read and it says overseer. It's because throughout the New Testament, elder, overseer, pastor, all interchangeable for the same office. Okay, so I hope we, we, we're on the same page there. The other office that Paul describes is in our text, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, and that is deacon. So we have elders, we have deacons. Now, I want to be clear about what I am doing this morning in opening up this portion of Scripture. I'm laying out what I believe to be the Bible's teaching on leadership, on what leadership ought to be in the church. 
And I'm doing so in anticipation of a future where we as Goshen First Brethren Church uh, seek to establish this type of leadership. Now, of course, we have elders. Uh, we, we, have, we have an elder. We have deacons. Right? We have had deacons for, for many years. We have had elders in the past. Uh, but when we see what the Scripture says about these offices and the wisdom that God uh, has, has exercised in giving us this, I think that as God's people, hungry for His instruction, we would want to say, yeah, that's right. Uh, and that's what we want. That's what we want to seek after. So that, that's, that's, that's the goal uh, this morning in opening up this text. So exemplary oversight. That is the requirement for the leaders in God's church. But before a man can provide exemplary oversight in the church, he must be an example of oversight of his own character. That's the first heading for the message this morning. He must provide exemplary oversight of his own character. Look back at verse 1. It says, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. This provides a trustworthy saying, one that we can take to the bank, that the office of overseer is a noble aspiration. It is a noble or a good or a beautiful even aspiration. Now, perhaps because of a lack of honor and nobility in our own culture, or maybe it's because of uh, the tensions that come with political office, it can often be heard, uh, people will say that the only one who would put themselves forward for any, any office is the one who's dumb enough to do it. And we can often talk about uh, serving in office as a necessary evil. Well, somebody's got to lead, and so it's the one who just you know, doesn't have enough sense to know how to stay out of that position. That's the one that'll end up leading us. Right? We say it jokingly, we say it kind of tongue-in-cheek, and yet uh, I think it speaks to a little bit of our heart when it comes to the offices of leadership in the church. Do we really believe that they are noble aspirations? If we do, then we would strive for them. If we believed that these were noble aspirations, then we would see uh, men striving for these things. That's what it means when it says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. The word aspire means that they reach for it. They're, they're seeking after it. Not only do they desire the office, but they are going for it. They're going to do whatever it takes to get there. They, they, have, they, they have a commitment to reach the conditions necessary to serve in that office. Now, notice it says, if anyone aspires. But what you need to know is, in the Greek language, that word anyone is in the masculine gender, which reminds us that this office of overseer is reserved for men in the church, and men only. Women are not permitted by Scripture to serve in this office. We, we, we saw that clearly back in chapter 2. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Therefore, the office of overseer, which is exercising authority in the church, cannot be filled uh, by a woman. So it is men who are to strive after this particular office, seeking after it, longing for it. This office is a good and noble thing. It's something that, that we should value greatly. Too often, men will fall into one ditch or another on the side of this road. Either we will fall into the ditch of just wanting to serve in the background, right? We'll say that the, the most value, the most honor is in serving behind the scenes, in doing the things that nobody will ever see. And is there value to that? Of course there is, right? Uh, but we will say uh, that that's actually the leadership that matters is the leadership that is behind the scenes. So that's one ditch that we can fall off into. The other ditch is that men can sometimes uh, have ambition to just simply seek to be at the top and to never serve and to never do the things behind the scenes. Sometimes men can be so ambitious that we want to just have the position without the condition of character that is required for that office. We can aspire to the position and not to the office. 
Those are two ditches. So what's the, what's the middle of the road? What is it that we ought to be seeking after? Where ambition seeks position only, aspiration seeks the condition of life that would be an example for others to follow. And an overseer must do that. An overseer must seek to live a life in a way that is exemplary toward others. This is why it says, verse 2, an overseer's character must be above reproach. Therefore, he says, an overseer must be above reproach. Now, the paragraph here uh, begins with uh, two words. He must, therefore, the words he must is one word. Uh, He must, therefore. That word, therefore, uh, tells us that the following list of qualifications are necessary because of the noble character of the office. Because the office of overseer is a noble office, is a high and, and, and honorable office, it follows that his character must fit that office. This is something that, that you would think is common sense and yet has been lost to the wayside. Leaders must have the character that fits their office. Period. Therefore, it says, he must. He must. Not that he should. Not that it would be nice if. Not that take what you can get. It says an overseer must. It is a requirement. A base level requirement for anybody that would aspire to this office. These characteristics then are non-negotiable. Now, above reproach serves as sort of like an umbrella qualification for all the, the qualifications that follow. So he must be above reproach in every other qualification that is listed here. But being exemplary, being above reproach does not mean that there won't be instances of failure in some of these things. In other words, being above reproach does not mean that the man is without sin. It does not mean that the man never uh, has, has faltered in any of these things. What it does mean is that when that has happened, that man knew what to do with that sin in repenting and trusting Christ. So not only is he to be an example of righteousness, he is to be an example of repentance for sin. So we're not looking for perfect men to serve in the office of overseer. We're not looking for the the ones that, that literally have not sinned in the last five years. That's not the qualification. What it is is that if you were to look at that person, if, if you were to announce to the church, hey, we are, we are considering this man for the office of elder, the office of overseer, There would be not a single person that could come and lob an accusation at him. He is the type of person to whom accusations just don't stick. Because even if somebody makes an accusation, the rest of the people say, no, you're kidding, you don't know the same man I do. That's not that man. He must be above reproach. Not sinless, but an example of righteousness and repentance. So he must be a man who is above reproach in the following qualities. There are 11 of them, and we'll try to take them one at a time uh, as quickly as we can. First, he must be above reproach in being a one-woman man. It says the husband of one wife. Literally, the Greek reads that he must be a one-woman man. Now, remember chapter 2's emphasis on God's design for marriage being reflected in the church. One of the bedrock important things that we do as a church of Christ is to reflect to the world what God's good design is in man and woman. We are his image bearers. As, as humans, we are image bearers of God. And part of that bearing, of, or part of bearing that image is that we reflect the, the, uh, uh, the, the godly union between man and woman and the roles and responsibilities that God has laid out for both. And so, it should be no surprise to us that when Paul gets to the point where he's describing who leads the church, that he must be the type of man who is exemplary in reflecting that relationship. That the, that the bedrock ground or first place where this man's character ought to be proved 
is in his marriage, is in his relationship with his wife. How he treats his bride is an indication of how he will treat Christ's bride, the church. Let me say that again. How he treats his bride is an indication of how he will treat Christ's bride, which is the church. Now, what is required in order for us as the congregation to see if a man meets this, meets this uh, qualification? We've got to know the man well enough and know his relationship with his wife well enough to see whether he really is this exemplary uh, picture of oversight. And Sunday morning will not cut it. Right? Anybody can, can put on a, a qualification for a, few mo- for, for a few hours on Sunday morning. What's he like when they get home Sunday afternoon and he's tired and wants to take a nap and hasn't had lunch yet? What's he like when they're facing financial struggles as, as a couple? What, what's he like when there is some sort of a crisis? What's he like when he has to give up some sort of a vacation or some sort of a personal uh, day out of golfing or fishing? What's he like uh, when it comes time to make a tough decision about where they're going to move or where they're going to live or about what job he's going to have? What's he like when he first walks in the door after work at, at 5.30 in the, afternoon, or in the evening? What's he like in those next uh, uh, 20 minutes? Well, how do we know that? Well, well, we'll see further on down the list that it involves that the church spend time together. It involves that the, the, the church knowing the man well before they call him to the office of overseer. Now, this particular requirement here has been the, con, the, 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 uh, um, the uh, arena of discussion for centuries. In fact, since the church began, there has been conversation about how this plays out. And one commentator said there are no less than 11 different traditions that have been tied to uh, the office of overseer in the church and relationship with a woman. And it, and it spans all the way from he must, he must be married and only be married to one wife, to he must never have been married, and must never marry at all. And, and somewhere in the middle, there, there's a whole span of other uh, ways that the church has, has diced this up. But what, when we realize that, uh, that we live in a world that is marred by sin and death, there are going to be some, some interesting scenarios, some difficult scenarios that come to bear on this particular requirement. Namely, what about a man who is a widower? And what about a man who is divorced? Are, are, those, are either of those men qualified based off of this qualification? Can a widowed man, can a divorced man serve in this capacity? We have to return to answer that question to the first umbrella requirement. He must be above reproach. He must be above reproach. And so the question for the widower is, was he faithful? In, in, his, in his first marriage, was he a faithful husband? Was he above reproach in his marriage to that woman? If he is remarried, because that is permitted in the scriptures, if he is remarried, is he now above reproach? Is he now a one-woman man? In other words, does he not have eyes for other women? Is he not constantly roaming the, 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 the landscape? Is his heart fully devoted to that one woman? He must be above reproach in that way, and the death of a spouse does not disqualify him uh, from the office of overseer. The, the, the situation of a divorced man is a bit more complicated. And the reason I say it's complicated is because the scriptures lay out a scenario, albeit a, a rare scenario, where a, uh, where a permissible divorce has taken place. And that is in the case of infidelity. The, the scriptures lay out a scenario where an unbelieving spouse abandons a believing spouse. And the scripture says to let, let them go. And they are not bound. In that case, is that person disqualified from serving in the office 
of an overseer. I think, as I, as I look at this, this case, I think that there, we, we have to leave the possibility open for that type of thing to happen. Because if the Scriptures can envision a scenario where a man is blameless, is above reproach, and yet his marriage ended in divorce because of the sin of his spouse, then we are not free to, to hold a requirement on him that the Scripture doesn't. Now, that being said, what would be required for the church to say uh, uh, with, without any qualification that that man was above reproach in that relationship? What would, what would be required for the congregation to know for certain that he did not have a hand in the dissolving of that marriage? Well, it would mean that the congregation had a front row seat to that entire relationship. It would mean that that, that congregation was a part of every step that took place as the marriage was disintegrating and as the spouse was, was abandoning him. It would mean that the man was above reproach at every point and every turn leading up to that divorce. And the, the, the fact is, friends, that in a world of sin where a marriage is binding two sinners together in a marriage, that rarely happens. It is rarely the case that one spouse, that the man would be, uh, would be above reproach and would be blameless. Why? Why is this such an important qualification? Because a marriage pictures the gospel between, the, the, the truth of the gospel, the relationship between Christ and his church. If a man who is serving in a leadership role in the church does not have a good picture of that relationship, how can he be an example to the church? And even more than that, verse 7 of our text tells us that not only is he to be an example to the church, but he is to be well thought of by outsiders. How, how can a man serve well in the church if constantly those who are outside of the church are, are making uh, side, sideward glances and, and, and kind of under their breath mumbling, well, you know what his life is like. Yeah, we know what his wife is like at home. I, you know, I don't know how he gets along serving in the church because, man, I, we, know what, we know what happens when the doors close at their house. That's, that's a distraction on the ministry of the church. That's a hindrance of gospel ministry, and that ought not to happen. A man must be above reproach in his marriage. The next two things we're going to consider together, uh, back to verse uh, 2, it, he must be sober-minded and self-controlled. Sober-minded and self-controlled. Both of these terms are used in Greek literature in reference to alcohol, but as verse 3 gets to dealing with that point, about alcohol, I think these are rather to be taken as figurative, uh, fi figurative uh, qualifications. Chuck Swindoll says that sensibility, sensibility ought to be the defining quality of the congregation, starting with its spiritual leaders. He must be a sensible man. If, if someone can be sober-minded and self-controlled, what would be the alternative? Right? Well, he's drunk-minded and controlled by someone else or something else. So a, a, a scripture points to the necessity of a man serving where he is in control of his own mind. He is in control of his own actions. He does not let an outside force be the controlling factor in what he thinks, what he does. But instead, he is in full faculty of his or he is in full control of all of his, fac his mental fac faculties. He is not bound to some other substance when it comes to his mind. He is not intoxicated with some other uh, substance or some other controlling factor. Now, Scripture points out one such controlling factor as passions. We, we often think in terms of uh, intoxication and substance abuse as you know, drugs, alcohol, that sort of thing. The Scriptures lay out more often that passions are what control our mind and our actions, even more than things like alcohol. What are passions? Passions are, are anything that is an emotion, uh, a feeling that's very intense, a desire. I point here because usually this is where you feel it, in your gut. 
passions are the things that when, when they happen to you, you know it because you start, your heart starts racing a little faster, your brow starts sweating a little bit, you, you start getting worked up. If you have self-control, you probably have to bite your tongue to not say something, right? You probably have to walk away if you have self-control. Passions are usually described as things that are worldly or fleshly, things that are sinful. For instance, Ephesians 2.3, uh, describing our sinful condition, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Titus 2.12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. The James 4.1, he asked the question, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Now, James is talking about in the church. He says to the church, hey, what is it that always gets you guys up and kicking up a, a, a fuss? Why is it that every time you guys get together as a church, you fight, you bicker, you go at each other's necks? What's the deal? He says, I'm going to tell you what the deal is. It's your passions. Your passions get inflamed and you let them have control over your mind and over your words and over your actions instead of having the mind of Christ. Passions are those strong emotions like anger and like lust and shame and even excitement or jealousy or selfishness. Passions can be a controlling factor in someone's life, but for an overseer, he must be the example of not letting those things guide him or steer him. He must be a stable influence who is self-controlled and not given over to other substances. He must be, fourthly, respectable. Respectable. This is the same word that's used up in chapter 2, verse 9, referring to women's apparel. They must dress in respectable apparel, and overseers must be respectable men. The word means orderly. He must be someone who is not chaotic. He must be stable. When you look at that person, they, they're the type of person that seems like they have things together. Now, in our world, it's really weird, okay? Our world actually values having a life not put together. If, if, you're, if you're on the, on the Facebook uh, or if you're, you're hip with the current young people trend stuff, uh, you, you find out that, that it's actually seemed, it seems to be uh, um, authentic or it seems to be a mark of good character to be able to, uh, to um, admit how much you're struggling today. Right? Like they, peop, I, don't, I don't know, if you're, not on, if you're not on social media, this will make no sense to you. Women actually take pictures of themselves just out of bed and with, with a hashtag of woke up like this with a smile on their face as if you're supposed to applaud them for the way that they look when they just have slobber running out their mouth and their hair is in 13 different directions. Right? There, there's there's a, a, a case, especially with men, where it can be seen as noble, where it can be seen as virtuous to admit how much of a mess we really are. That's been, that seems, well, he's He's real. He's somebody who just, he, he's just, a, he's just a, an authentic person. Well, Paul says that somebody who is constantly riding the struggle bus in their life is not qualified to be a leader in the church. He must be somebody who is respectable, who has an orderly life, who you look at and you just say, he just got things together. Things just fit. It doesn't mean that things don't happen. It doesn't mean that things don't, don't occasionally go awry. Of course they do. It's life. But when they do, he handles it in a way that, that we could say, yeah, that's an example of, of how I want my kids to handle that situation. He is respectable. He is hospitable, it says, number five. Literally, the word hospitable means he has a love for the stranger. He has a love for other people. He is hospitable to others. This means that an elder, an overseer, cannot be a recluse. An elder, an overseer, cannot be somebody who just wants to constantly be by himself, hiding away from people instead of being with people. 
An overseer must be somebody who, in fact, loves to have others around, loves people. My own testimony includes conviction on this very matter because when I first uh, uh, answered a call to ministry, I thought I would just go ahead and teach the Bible somewhere in a school or something because I get to clock out at 3.30 and then I don't have to deal with people after that. It'll be great. I can teach the Bible, not have to be on call all the time. Awesome. And then a dear, a, a, a dear lady convic- convicted me through, well, the Spirit convicted me through her that the Bible has people at the other end of it. The Bible is intended for people. The Bible is intended to be shared across the table from each other. The the Bible is intended to be in conversation with one another. It is the body of Christ that is the church. We are together. You cannot have an overseer or an elder who constantly wants to be in their study by themselves who does not want to be out among folks, about getting to know people, getting involved in people's life. He must be hospitable. He must invite people into his home. How else would he be an example to how uh, he treats his, his wife unless if you see that relationship in his own home? Just let your eyes jump down to verse uh, 4. How will you know if the man manages his own household well if you never step foot into the man's house? I wonder how many of us know of a church that went, their pastoral search committee uh, told the the candidate, hey, we're coming over for supper on Tuesday. And then we're going to come over for supper again next Thursday. And how about on church, uh, after church on Sunday for lunch? And see, how does he manage his household? Is Is he willing? Is he excited about that? Does he like to have people in his home? He must be hospitable. Number six, he must be able to teach. Along with hospitality, these two conditions, these two qualifications, mark the difference between elders and deacons. These two things are not found in the qualifications for deacons, which tell us something specific about what an uh, an elder, an overseer, is meant to do. He must be able to teach. Paul spells it out uh, in in more detail in, uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. They're, they're, 1 Timothy and Titus are like sister books. So he spells out more. He says that uh, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. He must be able to teach. Uh, an overseer, three things quickly from this verse, I'm not going to exposit it, he's got to know the truth. You cannot have an overseer who is not well-versed in the Bible. You cannot have an overseer who does not hold fast to the trustworthy word as taught. This also means that you cannot have an overseer who is constantly coming up with new ideas about what the Bible means. The overseer's job is not to be novel. It is to hold fast to what was handed to him. He is a steward of the word. He is not a a, 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 a new interpreter of the word. He must positively teach others what the word says. He must build up others in doctrine, and he must defend against false understandings of what the Word says. That's all encapsulated in he is able to teach. This is why Paul pairs that qualification in 2 Timothy with patiently enduring evil. He says he must be able to teach patiently enduring evil. A lot of times, when we teach what the Bible says word for word, And when we rebuke those who contradict what the Bible says word for word, we become the pincushion for all sorts of angry emotions. The overseer, in expositing and opening up and unpacking God's word, needs to be able to do it in a way where he remains stable as people come against the word. As people who maybe are hearing something for the very first time react with kind of a bit of shock. I I never knew the Bible said that. That's not the moment for the overseer to step in and to say, well, what's wrong with you people? Why didn't you hear? No, he's able to teach. He's able to bring people along to what the truth says. And then when somebody comes and says, no, I disagree. That is not what the Word says. In fact, you're a bigot for thinking that that's what the Word says. What's wrong with you for thinking that the Bible teaches that? 
that doesn't lose his cool, he doesn't lose his head, he remains respectable, he remains self-controlled and sober-minded, and lays out verse by verse what the scriptures say. So, if we insist on these qualities so far in the church's leadership, what would we have? Well, we would have a faithful example that could be followed in practically every circumstance you can imagine. You would have a man who is not steered or manipulated by his own passions or the passions of other people, who does not get his dander worked up when people disagree with him or, or, does not, uh, or can't function when he knows that people disapprove of him, or, or, or does not make a decision because he knows that it will please so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. You have a man who is able to walk through the Word of God and explain what it says for God's people in a way that is understandable, in a way that applies for, to, to daily life. And, and, and you would have a man who is able to protect the flock against false understandings when they come up. This is the type of man who must lead God's church. Those are the positive requirements. Look at number, uh, verse 3, number 7. He must not be a drunkard. Literally, he must not stay near wine. He must not be long at drink. If we ought not to be controlled by our passions, it makes sense, then we shouldn't be controlled by alcohol or any other intoxicating substance. This is the consistent teaching of the entire Bible. Drunkenness, hear me, drunkenness is always everywhere condemned as sin. Drunkenness, being controlled, doing things that you would normally not do because alcohol is involved, is sin. Full stop, no questions. Being controlled by another substance disqualifies a man from the office of overseer. Now, does that mean that, that because you know, he, he went to that party one time in college back then, does that disqualify him? Well, of course not. Did he repent of that? then of course he's, that doesn't disqualify a man. But a, a, a character quality of drunkenness absolutely disqualifies somebody. This does not mean, though, that the man must be a teetotaler. How do we know that? Chapter 5, verse 23, Paul commends for Timothy's use a little bit of wine for his stomach. And throughout Scripture, there are 252 references to alcohol in the Bible, different sorts. And of those 252 references, 149 of them, or about 59%, are actually positive references to alcohol being a sign of God's blessing or as a part of daily use. Now, to evangelicals, that, that number is kind of shocking, isn't it? Wait, the Bible says that alcohol is a blessing? Yeah, it's actually a sign that God has smiled on his people when the wine is overflowing in the vats. Of the 92 negative references in the scriptures, 58% of those negative references refer to drunkenness, but hear this. The other 42% of negative references refer to other sins that are brought about because of alcohol. Right? So, so you have a percentage, a, 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 a fraction of the instances of alcohol in the Scriptures describing how alcohol can make you do things that you normally wouldn't do and that would be a sin to do. For instance, verse 3, he must not be violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome. That word, not violent, means that he ought not to be a striker. Or figuratively, he ought not to be somebody who just likes to argue all the time, is constantly picking a fight with somebody. Uh, the, the, the tenth one we could pair with that, that he's not quarrelsome. This word is he's not a brawler. He's not constantly swinging his fists in whatever direction he can think of, whether his fists literally or his, his fists with his words. And those two qualifications oftentimes are brought about by the use of alcohol, are they not? Oftentimes somebody will, 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 will be more pugnacious or more violent when they've had something to drink than if they weren't. What ought we to be then? The ninth one is gentle. Notice how gentle is sandwiched right between violent and quarrelsome. 
not violent, not quarrelsome, but gentle. So, some people are kind of like a loaded gun with the safety off, and they're just looking for some direction to shoot. This type of person only knows how to deal with problems by fighting it out. And by the way, everything is a problem worth fighting for. Rather, the overseer must not be, he, he must not be that way. He must be reasonable. He must be slow to anger. Philippians 4, 5 says, let your reasonableness, same word as gentle, let your gentleness be known to all. Now, keep in mind that part of the job of an overseer is to correct false doctrine. Part of the job of an overseer is to, to, to uh, rebuke those who have fallen into false teaching. So it doesn't mean that he's conflict avoidant. It means that he deals with conflict in a gentle way, in a reasonable way, in a nonviolent way, in a way that, that seeks the truth, in a way that is loving. Last on our list is that he ought not to be a lover of money, a lover of money. Flip over to 1 Timothy 6. Same book, different chapter. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 and 10. Actually, verse 8. He says, But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And so therefore, an overseer must not be a lover of money. Does that mean that an overseer must be poor? That's not what that means. It's not that he must not have money, it's that he must not love money. And what's the opposite of love of money? Hebrews 13.5 says contentment. 1 Timothy 1.8 says contentment. Why? Why is this such an important thing? Because as Paul says to Timothy in chapter 6, the love of money is the, the root of all kinds of evil. This is why in the list of ten commandments, you get down to the bottom one. What's the tenth commandment? You shall not covet. You shall not covet. And then he lists all kinds of things you shall not covet. Why? Why is that the last? Because coveting, desiring what is not yours or not yours yet, leads to all sorts of other sins. Well, I want my neighbor's car, so I'm going to go take my neighbor's car. I want my neighbor's wife, so I'm going to go take my neighbor's wife. I want my neighbor's job, his reputation, so I'm going to go take it. I'm going to push him down. I'm going to raise me up. I want the power of God, so I'm going to go put myself in God's position. I'm going to create an idol out of my own self. Covetousness, the love of things which are not yours, is the beginning of all kinds of sin. And so it must not be true of the overseer. If he is not content now, he will not be content when he is serving. This is a qualification before he steps into the office of overseer. If he is not a person who is content with his lot, then he will only use the position of overseer to gain more. He will only use it for filthy lucre. Now, this does not justify the prayer of some churches where they uh, pray, Lord, make our pastor poor and humble. We will keep him poor and you keep him humble. Paul says clearly that a worker is worth his wages. So you ought not to look at this qualification and say, therefore, uh, we're going to make sure that pastor is always below the poverty line so that way he never becomes a lover of money. We're just going to take care of that qualification for, it, for him. No, he must be a man who is content with whatever the Lord has provided in whatever season. A greedy man will only cause issues later on. Well, we'll get to the other qualifications uh, next week, but the biblical office of overseer we have seen this morning so far is a noble role of servant leadership that requires a man of noble character. The reason is he's an example to the church, and so his oversight must begin with his own life. I asked you the question, 
if you were going to write out the, the description for the next pastor of this church, the next overseer or elder of this church, what would you put in it? Would you list 1 Timothy 3? Or would you have things like, he must be a charismatic leader? He must uh, be constantly uh, available. He must be uh, an expert at relating to the community around him, being able to reach out to all of the neighbors, being able to, to have you know, three or four hobbies so that he can relate equally to everyone in the congregation. He, he must be the type of person that is, is, is always, uh, always up and never down. What type, of, what type of person do you envision when you see a pastor, an elder, an overseer? How will we know that that person has such a character? The answer is that these types of leaders are shaped. They are discipled. They are cultivated. They are not imported. I will go as far as to say that it is next to impossible to truly know the character of a person from his resume or from his online sermons or even from the references that he has listed on his application because guess what? He picked those references. How do, what do you do then? Well, I, I look around our congregation and I pray... It is my prayer often, regularly, that we are developing and discipling these types of men in our congregation. That we have men that aspire to this. If, if, if you're a young person, if you're a young man, you ought to seek after this. This ought to be your goal. It is a noble calling. It is a noble aspiration. There is nothing more valuable that you could seek after than, than to be the husband of one wife, to serve the church faithfully. I, I, I long to see young people that for, throughout their ages, they grow in their, their wisdom and knowledge of the scriptures, they grow in their character, and then one day we, as a congregation, look at that person and we say, you know what? God has blessed you. God has really worked out your salvation with fear and trembling. We want you to lead us. This is, this is a great calling that we ought to aspire for and we ought to be raising up the next generation. For the, the congregation, we must know these qualifications and value nothing else higher. We must not be looking for any other thing in a pastor beyond these things. He might have other qualifications. He might have other perks, other things that are nice. But if he doesn't have these, he is not even to be considered. And as a congregation, we must know that. We can't leave it up to the man himself to say, yeah, I, I qualify. Don't worry about that. I qualify. No, you need, we need to, to scrupulously look into this because how many times have churches been held hostage to a man who is not qualified? Right? Somebody who they, who they have imported from a seminary somewhere because we thought that because he had those credentials, then he therefore qualified for the ministry. Right? That's, that's not the design. So we look to these things as, as the qualities that all of us are seeking after. Here's something, I'll, I'll end with this, that you need to know about this list here. Every single one of these qualifications can be found elsewhere in the New Testament to describe believers in general, not, not just leaders. Every single one of these qualifications is commended elsewhere of believers, not just leaders. What does that mean? That means that the leaders are the examples of the things that are required of all of us. So we look to this and we say, Lord, help us. Help us to be these type of people. Help us to set forward these types of people to lead us in the days ahead. Let's pray. Lord, we believe that you are faithful to lead us and guide us, especially as we hold fast to your word. Help us not to look in other directions, but help us to be content with your good design in all things. And Lord, we ask that you would grow us as a household of faith. 
uh, that you would provide for us such people in positions of leadership that we might be faithful, increasingly faithful in our day and age, and that we might be an example of how your grace shows up in a church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and in